Welcome to the What Really Happened radio show. The history the government hopes you never learn. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome to our show today. It's Thursday, January 28th, 2016. Sure, happy it's Thursday. Sure, happy it's Thursday. Sure, happy it's Thursday. We have lots of stuff to talk about today. The phone lines are open, 877-300-7645, 877-300-7645. Tom is sitting in our control room, twiddling the dials, keeping us out of trouble and ready to answer the phone when you call on in. Now, turning over to the war zones... Holland is going to discuss joining the Syrian airstrikes within days. All these countries are getting ready to go on in and bomb Syria into rubble. And the timing is very suspect. Because everybody, you know, R- Russia and Damascus, they're trying to have peace talks. And all of a sudden, no, no, we're going to forget the peace talks. We're going to go on in. Clear attempt to derail the peace talks. And unfortunately, it does appear to have worked because now we are getting word courtesy of the Daily Star, the Syrian Opposition Council will not go to Geneva tomorrow to attend the peace talks. So, they're not going to be there. Uh, Syria and Moscow do not want the U.S.-backed terrorist groups. This thing is already falling apart. And it looks like what is getting ready to happen, according to this article over in Sputnik News, the U.S.-led coalition is just going to invade Syria. They're, They're... Still trying to be under the pretext that we're going after ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the rest of it. But they're all getting ready to basically just go on in, get rid of Assad, put in puppet ruler. And the question, of course, is what is Russia going to do? Because Russia's already inside Syria. They've got an, at least one air base. They've got hardware on the ground. What's going to happen? Is this really the beginning of the war with Russia? Are they really that insane? All right, let's see. Hundreds flee southeast Turkey war zone as 23 killed and curfews extended. And here's an interesting little story. This comes under the heading of I Told You So. A newly declassified report from the George Bush administration shows that the United States invaded Iraq with no, meaning zero, zip, nada, hard evidence of weapons of mass destruction. And I know you're not surprised because we were telling you that. But this is just another in a long line of wars started with lies, fraud, and deception. Torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin. Spanish mine in Havana Harbor. Lusitania's not carrying weapons. Pearl Harbor was a complete surprise. Trust us. And on and on and on. And this was another one. The U.S. government lied to you to get your money for war and to send your children off to be killed and crippled in what was basically a war of conquest. And when are you going to get angry about the way you're being treated? Now, the Iraqi Kurds have agreed to hold a referendum on secession. This is part of the plan to balkanize both Syria and Iraq. Israel's agenda in the region is to take all the big, strong countries, break them into little tiny pieces that can be bullied and pushed around, and this appears to be a major step along that direction. All right, we're going to grab ourselves a phone call. We're going to talk here to Richard in... uh, I'm not exactly, I don't see the abbreviation. Oh, Mississippi. Uh, And uh, what's on your mind? Well, with the water crisis and the money money the government is borrowing, this is an odious debt. Which one's an odious debt? You like the wars, money pouring onto Wall Street, and money that's not been used for our benefit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. This qualifies as an odious debt, and for those who don't know what we're talking about... Uh, There is a principle in international law that the people of a nation are only responsible for debts incurred by the government for purposes related to the care and upkeep of the nation. Uh, If the U.S. government borrows money to build better roads, schools, railroads, things like that, we are obligated to make good on those debts. When the government borrows money to wage war uh, or to pour money all over Israel, or to fatten up the Wall Street bankers, that is considered odious debt and is not the responsibility of the people of that nation. And there have been nations that have gone through changes in government where vast amounts of the accumulated debt of the failing regime are are simply written off. And what is really interesting is apparently the Federal Reserve, uh, in partnership with some of the other private central banks, are trying to put together a legal argument to suspend odious debt because 
you know, they, they think that debt is something real and that they, we should not be off the hook just because the government misspent the money, mismanaged the nation. It's no reason to let the people, you know, off the hook. But, yeah, absolutely, a lot of this is odious debt. And if you look at how much money the government takes from the American people and how little is being spent back on us for things like clean, safe drinking water, you come to realize that the vast majority of that gargantuan debt we're always being told is out there is not the responsibility of the American people anymore. And nor is the collateral pledged against that debt subject to forfeit. Okay? That is, that is correct, Mike. Yes. That's something we may, will need to keep in mind. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, if the government is doing all this without our permission... Uh, we're not responsible for the debts, for the out-of-control debt. We keep voting for the candidate that promises, you know, balanced budget and lower taxes, and we never get it. So we're, you know, we can't be held responsible, and I refuse to be held responsible for an out-of-control government. If we're not allowed to make the key decisions, we are not responsible. We've got epic vote fraud to point at, politicians who lie to get elected and then do whatever it is their, their fat cat donors tell them to do. You know, that's the upside of being completely disenfranchised. We, we cannot be convinced that we're responsible for the mess that they're leaving behind. You are dumb enough to invest in the United States government without doing due diligence. Well, you're going to have to take the loss. We're not a fascist country anymore, and that means we're not going to eat the losses, we the people. Okay? Okay. So thank you very much for the phone call, Richard. We're going to let you go. And uh, it looks like we got... Keith in Montana. Aloha, Keith. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Well, that was fast. Hey, I got two things for you today, Mike. Yes. I noticed on your site there you had the thing about how the New York residents are being fined for uh, uh, their parking on the streets. That was Washington, D.C. And, and oh, okay, well, same thing. Yeah, all those cars are trapped in snow, and the D.C. police are out there writing parking tickets, a million dollars worth of parking tickets on the people of Washington, D.C., because they couldn't move yeah, their cars in the snow. Well, there's a there's a second part to this, Mike. Yes. Seven hundred plus million dollars to arm and train those so-called rebels. You know, a snowplow and a and a gravel spreader only cost about one hundred and forty thousand. Yes. How many of those could have been bought and trained drivers? Yeah, I, I mean, that, we're in a wartime economy. They don't want to admit it, but we are in a wartime economy. The government is taking everything it can from the American people, and they're spending it on these wars of conquest, and our country is rotting away. Our cities are not prepared for these hard winters, all the more so because they were buying into this human-caused global warming. Snowfalls are a thing of the past. They've been caught by surprise, not Boston, because of the winter they had last year. They said, all right, Al Gore is full of it. We're going to get some equipment in here and get it stockpiled. But, you know, we're seeing that with uh, the decayed water in Flint, and now it turns out the entire state is in trouble with their water supply, and other states are starting to wake up on that. The uh, Porter Ga- uh, Ranch gas leak, the Deepwater Horizon disaster, leaking radioactivity out of Hanford and WIP. I mean, the nation is rotting in place because our government is not performing its primary obligation of maintaining the state of our infrastructure. They're too busy giving the money to Israel and giving it to Wall Street and, you know, fighting wars of conquest around the, around the globe. Yeah, I, I get a chuckle out of watching those YouTube videos of these icy road car crashes and stuff. And, I'm, and you have to think, though, this, this is a, a, a what do you call it, a, like double jeopardy type thing, where uh, you crash your car, insurance costs go up, uh, it, it just fuels the thing there. But like I say, they can't afford to put out more snow uh, plows out on the road. They can't afford to sand the roads and stuff like that. But boy, I tell you. You'd imagine the deaths and all that stuff that happens because of this uh, uh, failing infrastructure. Absolutely. People are dying because our infrastructure is being neglected. Because government wants to send your money to Israel and Wall Street and to bomb people with. We'll be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. Getting back to international politics. As you know, Poland just went through a change of government and voted themselves in a new conservative government that basically wants to run Poland for themselves and not get tangled up with everything else. And immediately, of course, international condemnation. Oh, they're, they're a tyranny. They're a dictatorship. We've got to go in and restore democracy to Poland. In other words, they're going to set up another Maidan, another 
uh, staged coup d'etat to drive out a government that's refusing to go along with the new world order and put in somebody much more obedient. Now, these coup d'etats are not going very well. As you know, the U.S. backed a coup d'etat to uh, destroy the legitimate government of Ukraine back in early 2014. They put in Poroshenko, and Poroshenko has not only failed to do what he was told to do, uh, he's created a lot of problems, and apparently up in Davos, Poroshenko and the Russian deputy prime minister got into a, a public argument which ended with name-calling and grabbing each other's clothing and shaking, almost came to blows before they were pulled apart. So the situation is spiraling very much out of control. Now, a couple of alarming stories. Over at Military Times, Russian aggression, a top concern in U.S. European command's new military strategy. And they're out there talking, you know, we have to be ready to counter Russian aggression. And they're still pushing this idea that Russia is the aggressor. Who invaded Afghanistan in 2001? Who invaded Iraq in 2003 on the basis of nuclear weapons that didn't exist? Who invaded Libya? Twice. Who invaded Yemen? Twice. Who supported that coup in Kiev in 2014? Russia is not the aggressor. The U.S. is. And they're out there trying to push for this war with Russia that we cannot win conventionally and probably not even nuclear. Story coming out of uh, uh, KateHahn.com. The Pentagon declared Russia is the main threat in Europe. So, for all of my listeners who are in Europe, okay, <clears throat> unless you want a third time around of a world war fought on your front lawns, you'd better all get together, stand up and slap Washington, D.C. upside of the head and tell them to take their war somewhere else because I guarantee you this one will go nuclear. Because the U.S. cannot prevail in a conventional war against Russia and China. The U.S. has been at war against Iraq for 25 years, a quarter of a century, and against a lot of other people ever since 2003, 2001. The stockpiles are drawn down. The systems are all worn out. We know about the Russian electronic warfare uh, capability is astounding. Remember the USS Donald Cook incident up in the Black Sea? American weapons are the most expensive on Earth, and they're not very good. We have the Independence-class littoral combat ships, under-armed, under-armored. Their computers are wide open to jamming, and they're suffering a corrosion problem. The Freedom Class littoral combat ships, and by the way, littoral combat ship is something you build to invade somebody else's country. It's not a defensive weapon, it's an offensive weapon. So the Freedom Class littoral combat uh, ships, the first two out the barn had serious mechanical problems. Maybe a design flaw in there. F-22 still asphyxiating its pilots. The list of problems with the F-35 is legendary. And on the day when the U.S. realizes it cannot win a conventional war against Russia and China, they will resort to their nuclear arsenal. And you need to remember, back during the Bush administration, U.S. nuclear doctrine was changed to allow for the possibility of a preemptive nuclear first strike. In other words, our best option is just let the missiles go and uh, hope we catch them by surprise. And Russia is taking this very seriously because we're getting a report out of TASS. Ten regiments of Russia's strategic missile force have been placed on highest alert, active combat duty. They've got their rockets out there on the trucks and the, the, everything. They're moving them around into positions. They are clearly seeing it as a very real possibility that the U.S. could actually just say, out of heck with it. Let's just let the missiles go. All right, we're going to grab ourselves a phone call. Andrew in New York. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Uh, hey, Michael. Um, this kind of messed up this week of why this, uh, this virus in South America is being caused by the GMO uh, mosquitoes that are carrying this. It's thing. been, it's been, uh, there's one theory it's being carried by it because uh, the uh, uh, Zika virus is carried by only one specific species of mosquito but it happens to be the same species that was used for these GM experiments where they created a GM mosquito and, you know, made millions and millions of them, 
dump them into the jungle, and then they're surprised that the population numbers are going up along with the uh, number of infections. And we're now seeing cases in the U.S. Uh, and start to emerge around the world. Uh, is it the fault of this uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, project to depopulate the world? That's one possibility. Here in the United States, uh, you know, this Zika has been around in Latin America for quite some time. It may have been brought across the border with the illegal immigrants, along with H1N1, scabies, tuberculosis, plague, and all these other things in, in this brain-dead open borders policy. I mean, like, we should be closing the border right now, but instead people are using... We should, but they won't, because the New World Order wants to blur us all together, and if, you know, 10% of you die off of horrible diseases, that's acceptable losses as long as the remaining 90% are loyal servants to the New World Order. And many people are freaked out because they think that they're going to use this crisis to promote a mandatory vaccine. People. Of course they will. Of course they will. Anything that happens, there's going to be a mandatory vaccine to keep the pharmaceutical companies rich. We're going to be talking about that in a little more detail. There's been another mishap with vaccines. We're going to be reporting on that a little bit later in the show. So, uh, Andrew, thanks an awful lot. We're going to let you go. Story being put out there in Asia Times, will America go to war for the Philippines? And there, the spin is basically that China is invading our turf because of the strategic drawdown of Pacific forces. But what's going on here? All over the world. The U.S. is a collapsing empire. Everybody can see it. And it is natural for other nations to move into the vacuum created as the United States starts to fall apart. It's not an invasion. It's not an attack. It's not aggression. It's just good business. Nobody wants to do business with the United States anymore. They want to do business with Russia, China, Iran, nations that actually grow healthy food, manufacture quality products at reasonable prices. It's simple economics. And the U.S. wants to respond by bombing everybody who's a competition, which was one of the big reasons for World War II. We'll be right back. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to our show here. Now, the politics are getting really into bizarro land as you know, Saudi Arabia, acting as a proxy for the United States and its allies, has gone back into Yemen because those gosh darn Yemeni people tried to kick out the U.S. puppet ruler that we worked so hard to give them two years ago. Two years ago, Obama said this was a perfect example of a successful U.S. intervention. We went into the country and changed the government, and they're our friends. And here we are two years later, and it's an absolute disaster, and Saudi Arabia is in there uh, bombing civilians. With cluster bombs. And the United Nations just came out with a report saying, yes, Saudi Arabia is committing war crimes in Yemen. And everybody who is supplying them are accessories, which includes the United States, which even now is getting ready to send more rockets and bombs and missiles to Saudi Arabia to replace those that have already been used up. And, of course, Great Britain. So, very interesting story came out of the mirror over in Great Britain. They're poking fun at this Tory minister. Tobias Elwood, who was up there trying to defend the honor of Great Britain by saying, well, you know, we, you know, we, we don't know that war, we don't know what's going on. We haven't actually received the United Nations report. And then somebody pointed out that he was holding it in his hands, waving it around. And he tried to cover up by saying, well, we haven't officially received it from the United Nations. Well, you got the copy in your hand. Read it. Saudi Arabia is committing war crimes. They're being enabled by Great Britain and the United States. You are all guilty of war crimes. Now, one of the problems with that, of course, is that the leaders of all these countries are now boxed in. They can't quit the wars without facing war crimes charges. The only way they evade jail or the hangman's noose is to go on out and finish conquering the world, which they can't do. So you can see what a dangerous situation it is. We're going to grab ourselves a phone call from Eden, Pennsylvania. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey, Michael. Uh, my grandparents come from Russia 100 years ago, so I really love their history. And everybody knows Napoleon went into Russia uh, with, a, with his grand About army. About halfway. <laughs> yeah, it was like a NATO army, you know. 
and uh, it was it was all these different countries that were with them. And the Russians destroyed a hundred miles wide of their own land, burned everything, poisoned the wells, destroyed their own towns, right up to Moscow. And now, now what happened afterwards was uh, Alexander the First, who was a czar, he took a Prussian army and an Austrian army and a giant Russian army right into Paris, and they didn't burn nothing, they didn't rape, they didn't burn. Well, they, they stayed for a couple of weeks. They wrote a bunch of treaties up, and they left. That's your evil Russians. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the general rule of thumb of education and propaganda in the U.S. is we're good and everybody else is evil. And we know that's nonsense. We know that's complete and utter nonsense. There's always another side to the story. What we're taught in school, we see on TV and film, is it's a fiction. It's a fantasy to serve a political agenda. You know, finding the actual truth has to be an individual responsibility because no corporate media is going to give it to you. The pub, the government-controlled, state-operated schools will not give you the truth. They're going to give you what the government wants you to be thinking. We're good. They are bad. I remember when I was in grade school in New Hampshire, and I, 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 I don't know why it stuck with me all these years, but I vividly remember our social studies textbook. It was called Our American Heritage. I wish I could find a copy of it. And I remember it because it had this lovely painting of a Mississippi riverboat on the front cover. And inside there were all these cartoons about how terrible life in the Soviet Union was and how great things were in the United States. And, of course, years later as I got older and I actually met people from the Soviet Union, uh, it was obvious. It, it was very blatant, in-your-face propaganda to brainwash the American children. To how, just, how ugly their women were, remember that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I, I've, I've known some R- R- Russian women who are absolutely gorgeous. In fact, I knew this uh, actress I worked with in, in Hollywood uh, was just absolutely beautiful. And <laughs> it was almost funny hanging out where they're seeing the guys around just start to drool when they looked at her. <laughs> you know, they lost control of their glandular functions, as it were. But, no, it, it, it really – and I, I met some Russians when, uh, when I was working for uh, the space program. Uh, I met a delegation from Russia at one of the SIGGRAPH conferences. They got permission to come to the United States and, you know, share what they were doing with computer uh, animation. And it was almost funny seeing all the FBI spooks, you know, looking over the shoulder of the, these Russians to see if they had something, you know, uh, of strategic value to the United States. And they, they were like years behind where the U.S. was. They were playing catch up. But uh, the FBI was there just, you know, what are they doing? What are they, do they have something we don't have? So, well, they got Bressingham's algorithm. Is that classified information? No, actually, it's in Chapter 1 of the textbook. And they just, you know, absolutely moronic behavior on the part of uh, the Bureau. Uh, but, yeah, the, everybody potentially is going to be good or bad on an individual basis. Overall, people tend to be good. People tend to be altruistic. It's only these sociopathics that seek power over others, that screw it all up for the rest of the planet. Well, Sweden, Sweden started the war with them in like 1702. And Russia, did, Swedes were the baddest on the, on the continent at the time. Yes. And uh, Russia didn't want nothing to do with them. And 20 years later, Sweden was bankrupt and broke. And thousands of Swedish soldiers were marched through Moscow, and they spent their life in Russia digging canals. They were allowed to marry and everything, but they were digging canals. They're generals and their soldiers, thousands of them. Well, you know, war can bankrupt a nation. That's what's happening to the United States. The U.S. government is taking every penny they can from every single American, and they're pouring it into the machinery of mass death. And obviously this war agenda is already failing. When in history have you ever seen a nation have to go back into the nations it's already conquered and reconquer them Every two to three years. Uh, that's, that's really where we are right now. Uh, the U.S. is going to lose this war. There's no other way to put it. The U.S. is going to lose this war conventionally and probably nuclear as well, and I'd like to avoid that. Because we should be best friends with them. You know? We should be best friends with everybody. And yes, we would yes. normally be best friends with everyone, but yes. you know, the, you know the, the money junkies can make more money off of war. The bankers love wars. Uh, wars plunge everybody back into debt. The bankers reap a huge bonanza of debt and interest off of wars. Bankers hate peace. They can't make money off of peace. They want a big war to smash everything so that they can loan us more money at interest to rebuild. Okay? Thank you, Mike. All right, going to let you go. 
Thank you for the phone call. Now then, over in Britain, they're coming up on their referendum regarding the membership in the European Union. Bernard Ingham is out there saying that they basically have one foot in the grave if Britain doesn't vote to leave the European Union. And part of it is uh, this concern that the British taxpayers are going to be shelling out vast sums of money to Brussels to have Brussels come on in and tell them how to run their country. And the, the Brits aren't very happy about that at all. Now, one of Margaret Thatcher's aides, her former press secretary, Sir Bernard Ingham, has come on out and said the European Union is not a democracy. It's an oligarchy. It's infested with con artists and fraudsters. And Britain is going to be wasting 12 billion pounds a year feeding this monster so that they'll come in and tinker. David Cameron, of course, is out there. He's very pro-EU. He's very pro-New World Order and globalist. And he's out there saying, this deal with the European Union, this renegotiation is going to work out really great, which is kind of a reckless thing for him to say because they haven't actually written out the new proposed deal yet. That's not going to happen until after the referendum. And Cameron is out there saying, don't worry, you don't have to read it. It's going to be great. The same thing we're getting with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Just trust us. We'll make it work for you. How could you not trust us? We're the government. All right, we've got to take a break for commercials. We'll be back. We've got a phone call waiting on the line. We'll be back after these few words. Oh, hi, America. Welcome back to our show here. And we're going to go ahead and grab a phone call from Dan in Oklahoma. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, Michael. I want to talk about the F-35 and a few reasons um, why it's a terrible airplane. Mm -hmm. Is um, Way back when, the Air Force decided to uh, come up with a, a scheme called the Hilo Mix, a uh, multi-mission, multi-branch aircraft, um, another PR spin. And, uh, you know, the second you go to make a multi-mission aircraft, you're not going to have a good aircraft. You're going to have a something that's just money's been poured into, uh, not to mention you have three different bureaucracies fighting over specifications, um, the uh, Navy, uh, Air Force, and Marines. And uh, the, the Marines have had this mindless passion for uh, vertical lift, um, which which sucks up gas. You need to, uh, It's a waste of space. You need short wings. You need to, uh, 108 pounds of um, of uh, Air pressure uh, per square foot of wing, which makes it highly unmaneuverable in uh, dogfighting. Uh, Pierre Spray talked about this. Um, and uh, the terrible bomber carries ridiculous payload. It's it's fat. Um, I think it's, you, you know. It, I think it, it can only it only has room for like three seconds worth of ammunition in the cannon. Just three seconds uh, it, worth of fire in the cannon. That's that's ridiculous. That's like that's as brain dead as when they designed. The F-4 without even having a cannon at all, because they, yeah, our right. missiles will solve all of our problems, and the kill ratio fell from 12 to 1 to 3 to 1, because the other guys would evade the missiles, get in close, it would be a gunfight, and the F-4 didn't have a gun. Uh, they eventually right. built one that strapped onto the, to the belly to even things out, but some of the thinking in the Pentagon you have to wonder. Now, the whole idea of a multi-role whatever is always sold on the idea that we're going to put all this money into developing this one tool that can be used for all these different things. It's kind of a Swiss Army knife of war, and then we'll manufacture a whole bunch of them so the cost per unit goes down. It's never worked out that way. And yeah, you'll never, you'll never get a good aircraft when you... Or ship, or tank, yeah. or vehicle. I mean, again, I, I love that movie, The Pentagon Wars, based on the development of the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle, and it, it, it illustrates exactly what you're saying. They started with a very simple concept, a vehicle to get troops to the front lines and back as quickly as mm -hmm. possible, and said, then, oh, well, we're going to add this gun, we're going to add this, we're going to put this in there, well, we'll take some of the people out, we're running out of room. And it, it, it turned out to be a hideously expensive piece of junk. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, and as far as close air support for troops, that's the most laughable thing of all with the F-4, because it's lucky it sucks up so much gas, it's lucky it can hang around um, the, 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 uh, the support zone to support troops. You need to hang around for four to five hours. It's, yeah. You need a big gun like the A-10. You yes. need a, a heavy payload, which the F-4 doesn't have a heavy payload. Uh, you need to be able to turn sharp enough and get close enough to a target, especially when you're uh, supporting troops on the ground. You have camouflage targets that you can't see. 
So how can it turn uh, fast enough? How can it go to slower attack speeds? That's that's hopeless. So it's a hopeless dogfighter. It's a hopeless bomber. And uh, it's a hopeless close air support. That's the most laughable of all. And people ask, you know, what's the point of the plane? The point of the plane is to spend money. It's a yes. banker plane. It's, it's, it's exactly plane. right. You're exactly right. The F-35 is a classic example of that. They're trying to be all things to all people, and they're succeeding at none. Uh, they finally got the arrestor hook issue fixed so it can actually land on a carrier. Uh, right. But uh, uh, it can't fly in the fog, can't fly in the rain, can't fly near lightning. Uh, it's uh, supposed see-through cockpit visualization system uh, doesn't line up in those $400,000 mm-hmm. each helmets. Uh, the networked target sharing system uh, is creating false targets. It's not able to resolve how many real targets there are among uh, multiple aircraft platforms. You know, it, it all sounds good in theory and during the bidding, but it really doesn't work. And, of course, the final insult was they were uh, doing some uh, air tests with it against 1970s vintage aircraft. It can't even dogfight, even if it had more than three seconds worth of ammunition in that cannon. It, you know, it looks great. It's not an effective platform. And, of course, Russia and China have gone the other way. They design an aircraft for a specific combat role, and they make it very good at that. And they're much cheaper than American aircraft, which means they can make much more of them. And it's, mm-hmm. that's what you do when you want an effective fighting force. You do it the way they do it in America when you're on cost plus uh, military contracts and the goal is to just soak the American people for money for these impressive looking weapons in the hopes that you're never actually going to have to go to war because they're not going to work very well. Right. And, uh, and you know, the, the whole stealth thing is a scam altogether. Every stealth fighter today can be picked up by 1942 uh, Battle of Britain radars, uh, which have a long wavelength, and that's why they're still being sold to any country that's got cash. Yes. It's camouflage. And, you know, the F-117, when, 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 and a few years ago when I first started thinking about all this, you know, it had a ridiculous payload, all that plane two measly bombs, um, you know, the Yugoslavs figured out how to shoot the F-117 down. Well, the actual design of the F-117 was not to be a bomber. It's got a weapons bay for uh, rockets and whatever, uh, but its real strength was supposed to be that laser designator uh, in the nose, where the stealth fighter would go on in, paint the target with a laser, and let it be hit by a standoff launch munition from outside the defensive radius around the installation. And that's a really good uh, strategy. Working in combination with other assets like jamming aircraft, it's an effective platform. The mistake they made in Kosovo was just sending in the F-117 as if it was invulnerable all by itself. And you're absolutely right. Stealth is designed to defeat radars at a certain frequency range. Uh, the, the older, lower frequency radars can pick them up. Uh, the B-2, if it gets damp, becomes instantly visible on radar. I mean... I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and you know it just, it just sickens me, Michael, because if they follow through with this and they get rid of great air, aircraft, of like attack aircraft, the A ten, and other, you know, a lot of our boys are going to get killed if war does ever break out. And you know, we don't want any of our any anybody's boys to get killed. And girls, remember such, the, the, a, the new draft bill will draft girls into combat. Now the good oh, news is oh, they decided they're, they're yeah. going to keep the A ten. They decided to keep the A ten because. The new ground attack aircraft is unfortunately well on its way along the same path as the F-35. Yep. They're making money off of it, but yeah, they're, they're going to keep the A-10 in service. It's one of the few smart decisions I've seen come out of the Pentagon lately. That's the banker's favorite plane, the F-35, or the big turkey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the golden turkey. It's the golden goose. The F-35, that, that, that's its code name, the golden goose. <laughs> the apple of a thigh. <laughs> All right, well, listen, Dan, thanks an awful lot here. Let's get on back here. Now, <clears throat> as we mentioned yesterday, the people of France are beginning to stand up and push back against this dictatorship that was established uh, in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo false flag attack, and their anger has not been abated by that false flag attack in Paris uh, not too long ago. Uh, and it looks, you know, they're, they're standing up and saying, we have a right to criticize Israel. You can't have freedom of speech and say we can't talk about Israel or these other things. And they're really starting to push back. So apparently the government of France decided, well, we, we, could, we just need a few more false flags. And it looks like they botched two of them in a row because we got this story out of Russia today where a man with two guns, ammunition, and carrying a Koran got arrested trying to get into Disneyland Paris. 
No wonder they call it fantasy land. Obvious propaganda stunt. Guy went through a checkpoint with two guns, ammunition, carrying a Quran. See, I'm a Muslim. And then apparently there was another big stink over at the Paris airport where handlers, FedEx workers, had a package they were working that was damaged and ripped open. They looked inside and they saw a pressure cooker with wires coming out of it. And the U.S. Embassy came on over and said, uh, uh, these are just, uh, they're, they're simulated uh, bombs for a training exercise. Really? Why are they simulating a pressure cooker bomb for a security exercise at the embassy? So it looks like they're, they're trying to come up with more false flags, and they, they botched two of them in a row, which doesn't mean they're not going to keep on trying. And I think probably a lot of people are very concerned about uh, the Super Bowl, because it's not an original idea for a terror attack on the Super Bowl. You had that movie Black Sunday, and more recently, Some of All Fears. The terrorists will kill the Super Bowl. All right, we're coming up on the top of the hour, our first news break. And when we come on back, we're going to be getting into the economic news. Uh, the stock market had an up day. Doesn't necessarily mean anything at all, because we all know it's being rigged. The fundamentals aren't there. And don't take my word for it. Take a walk through your local town. Look at all the retail vacancies. Look at all the, the vacant homes. Look at all the homeless people out there. And then try and reconcile that image with claims that we are in an economic recovery. We'll be back after these few words. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to the show, hour number two. And before we get back into the news here, um, I forgot to mention at the start of the show, today is uh, the anniversary of the loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger. And like any other great event in history, you always remember where you were when you first found out. And I was in Milan, Italy working on a, well, actually, I was setting up a computer animation production company. And I remember going back to the hotel room, and my Italian wasn't really very good. And there, I walked in, there was the shuttle on the launch pad, and the announcer was just going on very, very fast. I couldn't pick up what he was saying. And so I saw it the way everybody at the Cape did, with no warning whatsoever. And it was particularly poignant because only three months before I've been working in Houston on helping set up computer graphics simulators for the man maneuvering unit and I got to work with Judy Resnick who flew on that particular mission so a little sad piece of history there now then we're getting word there's been another close approach incident over the Black Sea where a Russian Sukhoi 27 jet fighter came within 20 feet of a U.S. reconnaissance aircraft. And the U.S. is in high dudgeon. How dare you come up next to our aircraft? Well, it's international airspace, and pretty much anybody can go where they want to as long as they're doing it safely. The U.S. is making a big stink that the Sukhoi 27 flew right alongside us, and then it aggressively turned away, disturbing the controllability of the U.S. aircraft. Are they that fragile? catch a little bit of turbulence off the Sukhoi and they can't control it anymore? Boy, why don't you just telegraph that all of our aircraft can be broken by a little bit of turbulence and wind? They're trying to make a big deal about it. But we are seeing more and more of this rattling of sabers and glaring at each other. And again, if you go back to those stories I was talking about in the first hour, it is beyond question that the United States government is going to try and duck the responsibility and blame for destroying the economy of what used to be the greatest nation on earth by getting us into another world war because, by golly, it worked twice before. Third time's going to be a charm. And it's not going to work because we're going to lose this one. In World War I and World War II, the propaganda succeeded in convincing the American people and the military these were just moral and necessary wars. They don't have that this time. They do not have that this time. Now, getting into the economy, story out of Market Watch, the former Bank of England official, uh, Danny Blanchflower, who's now an economist at Dartmouth College, is saying the December rate hike by the Federal Reserve was a major mistake. And the Federal Reserve doesn't want to go back on that because it makes them look bad, but according to this individual, it's too late. The Fed has lost all credibility. Nobody believes them. 
part of the problem is the system is out of control. And it always has been. Private central banking is a naturally unstable system. And when it starts to break apart, you can't control. There's nothing they can do. There's absolutely nothing they can do. Everything is a holding action, a stalling action, or finding some way so that when it all comes apart, the real wealth is in the pockets of the money junkies and the people are left with worthless ink and paper. Jeremy Corbyn is poking fun at David Cameron, asking if ordinary British people can have the same tax rate that Google has. Cameron's going to say, of course not. But people have to pay higher taxes. Otherwise, we would have to tax the corporations. And they don't like that. They'll stop writing big campaign checks. Story coming out of Investment Watch blog. There is no real growth in America. Inflation is adjusted lower to create a fake growth, which is a roundabout way of saying, like the stock market, like the LIBOR, like the gold and silver prices, like the unemployment numbers, it's all being faked and rigged to make things look like they're okay. But when you get out in the real world, the indicators are all bad. Story out of BloombergView.com. The shipping news says the world economy is toast. Shipping activity from China to their major purchases of imported products, Europe, U.S., and Africa, it's down more than 40% since 2012. Almost half. And you know profit margins on these large corporations are much slimmer than that. Some corporations can go from being in, you know, hugely successful to serious trouble with only a few percentage point shift in the revenue stream. Story out of GovernmentSlaves.info. Massive downturn in container freight, shipping, and trucking as economy struggles to find consumers. Well, the consumers are out here. There's plenty of consumers. The consumers don't have any money. That's the problem. Because it's all been sucked out of our pockets and driven up to the top of that pyramid, and there's no recycling of that money back down to the bottom so that we can work, earn decent wages and salaries, and feed that money back into the economy to buy the things those corporations want to sell us and now are resorting to forcing to sell, uh, us to buy. That's the problem. There are consumers out here. We want to buy things. We can't. The money junkies have all the money. Another story from Investment Watch Block. Big companies, huge problems. Banks have leveraged every corner of the world and are running out of people to con into borrowing more. See, the way private central banking works, the instant that first pretty printed piece of paper goes into circulation, more money is owed to that central bank than actually exists. It's designed that way. And the way they can keep it moving forward, it's basically a pyramid scheme. And it works because you have the The first group of borrowers borrow some money, but there isn't enough money to pay it all back plus the interest. So you find a larger group of new borrowers, the next generation, college students maybe. And you plunge them into debt, and you use part of that money that's created to pay the interest on the first money. But then you have to find another larger new ground floor on that pyramid. It's a pyramid scheme. And like all pyramid schemes, it's going to collapse. Now, because the Federal Reserve had the entire population of the United States playing along, it was able to last about 100 years. But all pyramids fall. And now all these globally linked private central banks have exhausted the entire planet. There are no new borrowers out there because lions and tigers and bears are too smart to take out applications for credit cards. And that's why the system is locking up. Because there's no new money being created to service that debt. Under private central banking, debt always exceeds the available money supply. It doesn't matter how hard you work, how much you sacrifice, how much austerity you have to deal with, how much toxic water you have to drink in Flint, Michigan. You can never pay the bankers off. You are their slaves. And it is by design. The U.S. government could strip every single American naked, put them in the middle of the street, Sell everything that we have, house, clothes, car, everything, and still not have enough to pay off the debt. Because the debt is always designed 
to be larger than the available money supply. That's it. Germany has succeeded finally in starting to recover their gold from the New York Federal Reserve. They now got about half of their gold back in Frankfurt. There was a big stink going on there. There was a big fight going on there. Germany's Bundesbank was out there saying to Germany's government, no, you can trust the New York Fed. You know, you don't need to see your gold. Germany's government and a very active segment of the population in favor of repatriation, they've now gotten about half their gold back. Somewhere between 200 and 300 tons of gold have been returned. The rest is still somewhere out there. But other countries that are trying to get their gold back from the New York Federal Reserve are running into a brick wall. We'll be right back. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking about the economy. We're talking about gold. And right now, gold dilution, which is the fancy money junkie word for overselling paper gold, has now hit 542 ounces. That means for every one Real ounce of physical gold. There are paper contracts out there for 542 ounces. And now you know why everybody is scrambling, trying to grab the gold. They're very angry that they, they drove gold prices down so they could grab it, and instead Russia and China have it. When this blows up, gold is going to go over $50,000 an ounce. Of course, at the same time, a gallon of milk is going to be a thousand dollars, so no way do you win. Article coming out of Deviant Investor: Gold deficits, Fort Knox, and a reset. And they're talking about the flaw with our central government, where they're borrowing today and just they never get around to controlling spending in the future to pay it back. There was actually at one point an attempt to mount a constitutional amendment saying that for each presidential administration, any money they borrowed had to be repaid before the next administration came in. So the next administration came in with a clean slate. Needless to say, it went absolutely nowhere, because the attitude in Congress is, we're going to borrow and spend, and it's somebody else's problem to pay it 50 years in the future. That's all our children and grandchildren are good for, is slaving away to pay off the debt for what we're spending right now. Now, global debt exceeds $200 trillion, a number that is so large it is beyond easy comprehension. The U.S. official debt is $19 trillion, with unfunded liabilities in the $1 to $200 trillion range. And behind that is the big, ugly D-word derivatives, where the exposure there is up in the quadrillions. And all of it's make-believe. All of it's make-believe. Most of that money that is owed never existed. It's just an entry in a bookkeeping ledger. The derivatives are basically gambling debts at incredible odds. That money never existed and does not exist. All right, we're going to go ahead and grab a phone call. Nathan in Florida, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Oh, hi, Michael. Uh, it's uh, Nathan in California. And uh, pardon me for... Uh interrupting your uh, economic uh, segment here. I, I missed the first uh, 45 minutes of the show. Uh, quick question. Have you seen the video uh, eyewitness account of uh, Lavoie Finnegan's murder by federal agents on the uh, on YouTube? Uh, that's the one that just has the voice of the person who was in the car, correct? Yeah, it, it's like okay. a... I don't know. I, I figure a 14-year-old uh, teenager that was actually in the vehicle when yes. they started shooting. Have yes. you heard that? Yeah, I've heard that. I was I, I was I was checking in case there's been an actual video of the shooting surface. Aren't those police all supposed to have body cameras? Why don't we have a video? Oh, exactly. Well, it, it was um, what what she described was an ambush, and uh, the federal government, in my opinion, is in big trouble. They thought that everybody that left the refuge was, you know, part of the seizure of the refuge. Uh, this 14-year-old girl, you know, pardon me if I'm wrong off a year or two, but she was hitching a ride to go over to the meeting to sing with her family, you know, at this particular event. She has nothing to do with, uh, you know, seizing the refuge or anything, and so they had to let her go. 
they were able to arrest uh, uh, Ryan Bundy and Shauna Cox, and they're in custody, but the the government must have been shocked that they had to let this kid go because now they have an actual eyewitness who says it's like 102 shots. The vehicle is, is just riddled with bullet holes. You know, they're shooting at uh, her, uh, Shauna Cox, and uh, Ryan Bundy in the back seat of the vehicle. She saw uh, Lavoie put his hands up and say, well, why don't you just shoot me? And they did. And she said several people shot at him at the same time, and they killed him. And she said, you know, we, we, we just want to help him. And, and they started shooting at the vehicle. And, and this poor girl was traumatized, absolutely traumatized. And, you know, being the father of a teenage daughter, uh, you know, they're all grown up now, but I would be absolutely furious with the federal government you're trying to kill my t- unarmed teenage daughter in the back seat of a car yeah, well that's what she gets for hanging out with dangerous subversive radicals the problem is the u.s government has gotten itself into another mess just like ruby ridge and just like waco yes, they have they are in the wrong they know they are in the wrong and the only way they can think of getting out of the mess is to just kill everybody to, to bring the matter to an end. And we're seeing uh, some very alarming warning signs, like the media has been asked to leave very firmly. The FAA just declared a no-fly zone over the wildlife refuge. They don't want anybody near there to see what's coming down. Well, they've, you know, they, they had to let this eyewitness go, and so now they have an eyewitness to murder, and it's like, what is the Oregon Attorney General going to do? Is he going to prosecute this bunch? I mean, hypothetically, and this is fantasy land, what if it was President Obama's daughter, Malia, that was in the back seat of this vehicle when they, you know, put over 120 bullets into the darn thing? She says the whole car is, you know, just riddled with bullets, and they tried to kill her. I mean, that whole bunch would be, you know... Yeah, but but it, it's not Obama's daughter, therefore she doesn't count. Oh, I know that. I now, know that. now the, the latest word I have is that the police... Uh, we're able to come up with a couple of their own witnesses saying that uh, uh, Lavoie charged them and he had a 45 and, uh, uh, and a lightsaber and a chainsaw and a rabid wombat. Uh, but apparently there are now six eyewitnesses from around where the roadblock was set up who are confirming this young girl's story uh, that uh, uh, this guy, the victim, had his hands in the air. Exactly. And... You know, the police just hauled off and shot him uh, multiple exactly. times. Now, exactly. the, the cops are in the wrong here. And again, the big question is, all the police are supposed to be wearing these body cameras now. There should be dash yeah. cameras on the police cars. Okay, why are we not seeing any of the videos? I know, I know. And I, I tend to, uh, I, you know, when I listen to the uh, audio recording that uh Victoria made. I mean, this poor girl was traumatized. I mean, a 14-year-old girl in a car that's being riddled with bullets and she's claiming they're trying to find a white, something white to hang out the window to get them to stop shooting. And, and the government is shooting at a 14-year-old girl, another woman, Shauna Cox, and, uh, it was Ryan Bundy who was injured in the back seat as they're all going down, huddling toward the floorboards. Yeah. She said when she got out of the the vehicle, she had about 20 lasers on her. I mean, come on, you know, you know, 20 yeah. laser laser beams on a 14 year old girl. I mean, what is this? You know, this is uh, the result of uh, Israel training our people. You know, watch yeah, out for it that is. Anyway, listen, girl. Nathan, I, Nathan, I got sorry, got to cut you off. We got to take a break for commercials. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here, getting back to the economy here. The uh, top official in Japan in charge of negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership has just quit over bribery allegations. Japan's economic minister, Akira Amari, is saying that he's having to resign amid allegations of corruption. That may throw a monkey wrench into the uh, whole TPP, I hope. France is giving 1 billion euros aid to Tunisia to try and halt mass protests over their unemployment. 
Now, here's an interesting story that came out of truthlibrary.info. And we started hearing about this all the way back in 2012. Iceland moving to debt forgiveness. In other words, they're holding a modern equivalent of the ancient jubilee. They're just going to say the debts are erased. They're null and void. We're restarting the system. And if you go out and you do a Google, Google search on Iceland forgives mortgage debt on their population, you'll get hundreds of thousands of results, not a word in the American corporate media. Because debt to the bankers is holy. Debt to the bankers is sacrosanct. Debt is your slave chains, and we're not about to emancipate the slaves just yet. Now, for those of you who are car lovers, you may be delighted to know that after 30-some-odd years, 34 years, the DeLorean is going back into production. And those original DeLoreans, of course, they were made uh, famous by the Back to the Future films. And I thought it was a great little car. A lot of amazing engineering went into it. So they're going to start making them again. Whether it'll be an exact copy of the DMC-12, down to the stainless steel, or just kind of like what they did with the Hummer. Started with a really great idea, and then they made something that sort of looks like it, but isn't anywhere near as good. We'll find out. Over at DeVry University, they're in serious trouble. Because the Federal Trade Commission has said that, yes, indeed, DeVry was lying about the success rate of its graduates in finding high-paying jobs with which to pay down their student loans. And all of this is adding fuel to a growing fire of these college students who were lured into college, lured into student loans with the promise of high-paying jobs on graduation. And now they're saying they're the victims of fraud. And because they're the victims of fraud, those debts ought to be discharged. And I'm fully in agreement with them. College used to be about education and exploring new ideas, and now it's all about, you will not criticize Israel, you will borrow money, you will do as you're told, you will be our slaves forever. And they they want you to pay for that here. Okay, uh, let's grab a couple of phone calls here. Brendan in New York. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. How you doing? Doing fine. Uh, I have a real uh, quick statement about the Donald Trump uh, dilemma that's kind of been distracted. But um, I think that, you know, the whole thing has been a backfire against Fox because from what I understand tonight, they're going to get him with a Muslim questioner as well as a... uh, Yeah a legal immigrant questioner to try to trap him. I'm not sure how it's going to play out with the rest of the candidates, but, you know, I think it has absolutely nothing to do with Megyn Kelly, uh, but his campaign was wise to it, so they got him out of there. Just no, it was a combination of both, because, uh, you know, we, uh, going all the way back to that first Fox debate, uh, it was leaked out that Megyn Kelly and the others were going to try and provoke Donald Trump to lose his temper And they already had security guards ready to drag him off the stage and throw him out of the building. That's how desperate they were to discredit him. And Donald Trump whooped him, came back with that comment about Rosie O'Donnell. The audience was laughing on his side. And I remember the look in Megyn Kelly's eyes. She was just furious. How dare you not roll over and die before me, the ultimate feminist. And they were going to try and do it again. And Donald Trump did the right thing. He said, you know, I don't need this. Just like Reagan. Reagan ducked on the, uh, the last debate before Iowa and won in a landslide. And even better, CNN uh, is stepping in. They're going to cover Donald Trump's live political rally that he's having at the exact same time as the debate. And I'm going to make a prediction here. CNN's going to get the ratings, and Fox News won't. We ran a poll on our website. Now that Trump has boycotted Fox, will you bother watching tonight's debate? 97% no. They're not interested in the losers whining about Donald Trump. All right, well, that's all I had to say. Thank you so much, Mike. All right, thank you very much here. We're going to switch over to Bob in Colorado. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hello, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, we were talking earlier, or you were talking earlier about Oregon. Uh, I don't know if you know, Alex Jones sent his crew there. They showed up around, I think, uh, maybe 1, 1.30, something like that. They were just getting their feet on the ground. 
And they said they were going to try to get in there and find out what's going on. But they are there with cameras and everything. So Good for them. it'll be interesting to see what happens from here with uh, Alex's crew there. And, uh, well, I, I just hope they can get some type of information that uh, – can't, they can really get here. To well, you know, good for good for Alex because just having that camera crew present is going to inhibit, uh, you know, what what's going on uh, there. They they might not be so reckless. Now, of course, the media has been asked to stay away from that uh, that wildlife refuge, and that probably is going to apply to Alex Jones people as well. Uh, but you know, it, good that they made the attempt. Okay. I hope they. I just hope they can get uh, to the townspeople and really get some good information. That out would there. be really good. Yeah, I wish they them all luck. Pretty good. You know, Joe Biggs does pretty good. So I just wanted to mention that, Michael. Thank okay. You very that, much. Yeah, that's that's worth uh, making uh, note of and looking out for. All right, we're going to let that phone call go here. Now then, we have been talking about the linkage between what's going on in Oregon and this deal where Russia had acquired a Canadian company and then came in to acquire mineral rights on property inside the United States of America, including the land underneath the Hammond Ranch, brokered by Hillary Clinton, and there was a major payment made to the Clinton Foundation by Russia as this was all going down. Okay? The story has now been picked up by no less than the New York Times itself. And I would say that that pretty much makes a confirmation. Basically, Hillary sold the Hammonds land out from under them without their permission. And now she's sending in the Gestapo to get them off the land. It's not theirs anymore. I, I made a deal with Russia, and I always keep my word with the people who give me money at my Clinton Foundation. And we have seen the Bureau of Land Management doing this all over the country. They'll grab land for the protection of the desert tortoise or whatever. And then a couple of months down the road, well, it turns out we really didn't need the land and we're going to put it up for sale. And it goes to some politicians' cronies. That's what happened down by the Bundy Ranch, where all the land that was grabbed to protect the desert tortoise wound up being sold to private Chinese developers who just happened to be good friends with Harry Reid. Now then, story out of no less than the Washington Post. They're finally starting to come around. They're catching up with us, guys. That's a good thing. If they ever start doing their job properly, I'm ready to put all this down, spend the rest of my life as Claire's roadie. Washington Post, Hillary Clinton's desultory campaign is sinking. And they're saying there are four issues that she cannot get away from. Her performance as a candidate. In particular, her lack of sincerity, Sanders' viability, the continuing email espionage scandal, and the fact that she destroyed herself as a credible leader of the feminist movement. Four strikes and you're out of here. We're going to take a break for commercials. We'll be right back. Hello, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking about the Washington Post article on how Hillary Clinton's campaign is in serious trouble. There are four areas that are working against her. And the last one is the fact that she's destroyed her own credentials as a supporter of feminism. And it goes back to the comment that she made about how every woman who has been sexually harassed or abused has a right to be believed. And then, of course, everybody said, how about all those women that your husband was attacking? And, of course, she had to back, well, you know, they, it, that was proven that they were lying. No, it wasn't, as a matter of fact. Bill Clinton admitted to many of these sexual dalliances, settled out of court on one lawsuit, and Hillary destroyed herself. And Hillary's campaign in 2016 had been relying on what Hillary's campaign called the vagina vote. Women will vote for me because they're women. That's beginning to erode. And Hillary kind of destroyed the other side of the equation because uh, she hopped on board that 1990s male bash militant feminism from people like Gloria Steinem. You know, we don't need men. We're in charge of the world. And so Hillary, over the years, has alienated a lot of the male voters in this country. And having already done that, and now having lost credibility with women over this issue of sexual harassment and enabling her husband's abuse, 
that's working against her. Camille Paglia is out there saying Hillary's blame men first feminism is going to cost her. And then she, she goes on talking about what happened to feminism, which was the, and I've talked about this before, the original feminism was equity feminism, equal pay for equal work, equal access to credit, equal access to education. These are all laudable goals, and it was easy to support feminism back then. Then in the 1990s, you had the original equity feminists sort of lose control over the political machine. It was taken over by the, the gender feminists who didn't want a balanced equality. They wanted a reversal of the order. We had the all men are rapists and that's all they are. And the Catherine Comans, you know, a false rape charge is good for a man to go through. Andrea Dworkin was out there getting standing ovations saying that women should randomly kill men to put them in their place. It was completely over the top and out of control. And Hillary rode the tide of that, and it's going to cost her. Story coming out of the New York Times, Hillary Clinton stumbles. Because as Sanders is eclipsing her in these early primary states, in the polls, She's gone on attack mode, and it's come off as insincere, not to mention uh, ungrateful, because remember that first debate where Sanders got a round of applause saying, I'm not interested in hearing about those email things anymore, and every, oh, how, how great of him, how generous, how stupid. And now, after Sanders cut her some slack on that, she's turned on him. And... Hillary is trying to portray him as dishonorable when he behaved very honorably, and it's backfired on her. All right, we're going to grab a couple of quick phone calls. Steve in Florida, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hello, Michael. Um, excuse me. Um, yeah, Hillary's like Humpty Dumpty. She had a great fall. <laughs> well, she can't do but. Put back together again, but I had a question for you. Um, I don't understand. I mean, Trump could outsmart Megan, Silicon Megan, in a heartbeat. Yes. Why doesn't he just, like, sort of entrap her in saying something really stupid, because she's capable of it, and then just make a fool out of her? Well, he probably felt it was beneath his dignity to do so. Uh, and like I said, Reagan uh, did exactly yeah. the same thing. Didn't want to be bothered with it, won anyway. And uh, uh, again, we we know Fox was trying to set up an ambush on Trump. Uh, and, you know, uh -huh. why would Trump go through that? He's leading. He's two to one over his nearest competitor. And his nearest competitor isn't actually allowed to be president of the United States of America. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I get that. I get that now. I mean, I, I just think it'd be so easy. He's a shark, and he could, he could just... He could just trash her and, and you know, with one Yeah, whining, but then Megan iron. would come off whining and crying, oh, you know, they, 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 they'd go back to that thing about right. Trump's low attitude of women, look how he beat up on poor Megan. You know, you don't swing at the pictures that are down there in the mud, is, is basically the right. attitude, okay? Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, Mike. All right, thank you. And, uh, again, CNN is going to be, at the exact same time as the Fox News debate, CNN is going to be carrying... Uh, uh, Donald Trump's rally live, and I'm going to predict right now, CNN is going to have the lion's share of the audience tonight. Brilliant move on their part. All right, one more call. Joe in California, aloha, welcome to the show, what's on your mind? Hi, thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to say a couple of things real quick. I think one of them is Trump doesn't want to to the Megan Kelly level right now when there's more important things in the world. I agree. And then uh, when regards to the Oregon thing where the government tells everyone to stay home and turn off their phones and turn off their cameras and we'll update you with our version of the story <laughs> here. Good, and good luck on I that. They've got ham radios in that wildlife refuge. Of course, the U.S. is probably going to bring in some military jammers and jam everybody's communication. Yeah, but Harry Reid wants everyone to be over in the free speech kennels yes. and to say anything outside of those. That's probably yeah, what I they're going to do with Alex Jones' people is put them in that little chicken wire concentration camp thing and say, here, you can have all the free speech you want here. And, uh, of course, yeah. Jones will make a big stink about it, as well he should. 
And the most potent weapon we have against tyranny in this country right now is to ridicule them, make them look very obvious as to what they're doing, uh, and, and, and basically continue the process of letting them destroy their own credibility. Because when, when the entire American people stop listening and obeying and paying the bills, it's all going to fall apart. When the government prevents the people from peaceful redress of grievance, I know JFK said something about when you make peaceful protest impossible. The when you make pe- those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. He's absolutely right. I don't want to see a violent revolution in this country. Uh, I am still convinced well, that if we do not give this government an excuse to declare a national emergency in martial law, they're going to implode from their financial mismanagement, their internal corruption. It's going to be an exact repeat of what brought the Soviet Union down. Well, my, my point is this. The government doesn't want you to use a phone or a camera or anything, but when you look at today's courts, they have, like, the person who's under arrest is in one place and it's videotaped over to the courtroom and the cell phone is doing this. They're using all the technology, but they don't want anyone else. Oh, to yeah, that's, that, that's why they're trying to, you know, hack of all, all of our operating systems and force Windows 10 on us and you know, spy on us through our computers. They're scared of us. They're absolutely scared out of their minds that we are very close to a real revolution, one that they cannot direct and control for political gain. Anyway, Joe, I need to let making up. Yeah, I need I need to let you go here because we're coming up on the top of the hour and I I got some stuff I need to cover before the end of the show. Interesting little story. This came out of the Washington Post and it seems like a side issue, but it isn't. It's talking about how for the last two years The Navy's intelligence chief has not had the classification to know any secrets, and he's the intelligence chief. Vice Admiral Ted Twig Branch has been banned from seeing classified information since November of 2013 when the Navy learned from the Justice Department that his name had surfaced in a corruption investigation involving a foreign defense contractor and scores of Navy personnel. Now, they didn't actually have any evidence that he was guilty, but just out of an abundance of caution, they suspended his class of his uh, clearance along with one of his deputies, Rear Admiral Bruce Loveless, the Navy's Director of Intelligence Operations. 800 days later, neither one of these people are still allowed access to documents they legitimately need to do their job. Now, I'm putting this out here to show you how the government normally reacts at the suspicion that somebody may be engaging in corruption who is in possession of classified information. Because it stands in sharp contrast to how the government is treating the former Secretary of State and former First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, who we will be talking about when we come back from our news and commercials. Hello, I'm America. Welcome back to the show. Hour number three. The phone lines are open, 877-300-7645. Now, before we went to the top of the hour news, I teased this story about how two of the highest-ranking U.S. Navy intelligence officers had their clearances revoked 800 days ago. One wonders how they're able to do their job because they were named in a corruption probe. Just a hint of suspicion. And their clearances were yanked. And I said this underscores the fact that Hillary Clinton is being given a pass on all of her actions. Now, for those of you who have ever been involved with classified government work, above a certain level, you know, when you're getting your clearance, you have to sign a contract. And there's literally a condition in that contract that the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to you anymore, that the government can spy on you without a warrant to make sure you're not selling stuff to the Russians, and it's something that you voluntarily choose to accept in order to have that classification. You also get a very thorough education on the proper handling of classified material. And Hillary had to do exactly the same. Now then. The big stink going on right now is the fact that some of the classified documents on Hillary's private server were so highly classified, the congressional investigators had to apply for a special clearance to read them. Top Secret Special Access Program. Now, those kinds of documents are not put on any servers that 
access the open Internet. They're private, controlled, secure networks. And these networks only store the documents and present them for reading. You cannot send email off of these networks. You cannot open up web browsers on the Internet from these. It's completely isolated, air-gapped from the rest of the world. So the only way these top-secret SAP documents could get onto Hillary's private email server is somebody carried them over by hand, put them on a flash drive, and walked them over. That shows intent. There's no way that they they got there by accident because there's no electronic pathway between these two systems. Now, the FBI is investigating whether members of Hillary Clinton's staff were doing this. Obviously, somebody did it. We know that Hillary was directing some of these behaviors because of the email that came out in which Hillary is directing one of her stampers to remove the classification marks from a document in order that it can be sent to her through non-secure means. That right there is a felony. And the FBI is investigating whether this all cut and paste or how it was transferred so it could be sent to her private email address. Or, let's get right to the point of the matter, be sold to a foreign government in exchange for donations to Clinton's charitable foundation. That top secret SAP, the human material, they had a document that basically came from a human intelligence source, an agent in a foreign country. Those are the crown jewels. Those are the things foreign governments most want to have. And Hillary and her staff walked them off the secured, air-gapped network and put them on her private email server, which had weaker security than Ashley Madison. That's what's going on. Now, Tom DeLay is out there saying that his friends in the FBI are saying they've got the goods on Hillary and quite a few of her staffers, and they could come down with charges at any time. They don't need to work any further. they got the goods right now. But Ron Hosko is out there saying, yeah, it's probably going to continue for some time. You know, it, it, we, we may not hear from the FBI and, uh, uh, until after the primaries are over and we're in the general election, or maybe even after the election, or maybe even next year when President Clinton can pardon herself. It's delay, 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 stall, 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 stall. The Clintons have a lot of juice to be able to hold off the consequences of all that they have done throughout their career. Now, as you know, we've all been poking fun at the U.S. State Department for using last weekend's snowstorm as an excuse to petition the federal judge that is enforcing the release of uh, the uh, Hillary Clinton emails uh, to delay this final release uh, until the end of February, which would put it after the first four primaries in the country. And it's ridiculous to say we need a whole month here because we had two days of heavy snow. It's not like they got the notice to turn this stuff over a week ago. They've known about this for months. Now, Jason Leopold, the journalist whose lawsuit forced this issue in the first place, has filed a motion with the court saying, keep them to the original deadline, January 29th. It should be tomorrow. We haven't heard yet what the decision of the court is going to be. Now, the court may say, because of the storm, we'll put it off until next Tuesday, next Wednesday. That would be reasonable. I could understand that. But not to the end of February. But they're trying to stall and delay so that Hillary can go into the first four primaries without any more embarrassing revelations. And that right there tells us there's going to be something really juicy in there. Meanwhile, we put a flashback article. One of the released emails showed how Hillary Clinton's office requested YouTube censor a video about her. And YouTube said, yep, we will do that. 
let's see, Hillary Clinton's top financial supporter now controls The Onion. You know, the satire site. And they've been running some very funny stories like Hillary Clinton tries to woo voters by rescinding candidacy. Hillary Clinton to nation, do not mess this up for me. Hillary Clinton, the merciless, unrelenting march to the presidency. Those are all going to be gone. Because one of Clinton's supporters now controls the onion. Control the media, control the minds of the voters. Actually, it's not going to work. Apparently, a Hillary advisor has asked Twitter to block a new hashtag that is trending on Twitter. Hashtag words that don't describe Hillary. Which is usually posted with things like honest, truthful, so forth and so on. Now, Paul Krugman over at the New York Times is adopting a new tactic. They're using the word serious to basically delineate between people who are on their side and everybody else. Serious people are supporting Hillary Clinton. Serious, you know, foreign policy people. The serious people are all in favor of Hillary. And if you're not in favor of Hillary, then you're not serious and nobody should listen to you. That's a very subtle piece of propaganda, but they're doing that. Now, let's get on to Donald Trump because his fight with Fox News is not going very well for Fox News. Remember what I said before, what's going on here in the corporate media. They are in a desperate fight to prove they can still control the minds of America, that they can choose the candidates for us, that they can sell us the wars, because if they can't do that anymore, those individuals and corporations who are covering the hideous financial losses that these networks are going through right now, they're going to put their checkbooks away. And the party's going to be over. And so Fox News was out there desperate to prove, when we say Trump must go, he will go, and that's going to be it. And Fox may have hoisted with its own petard. We're going to talk about that when we come back from these words from our sponsors. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to the show here. And we're talking about Donald Trump and his feud with Fox News, specifically Megyn Kelly. And Fox News took the arrogant approach of, well, Donald Trump does not get to pick the journalists. And that was never the issue. The issue was the journalists trying to pick the president. And Fox News, very clear, everybody saw Fox News go after Donald Trump. And Fox News showed to its audience it's not fair and balanced. It's not the we report, you decide. It's we'll decide for you. Just watch the report and the ads. They wanted Trump out because he's not part of the establishment. The candidates they're pushing are the establishment, including the ones who can't be president. And not only have they destroyed their reputation for objectivity and balance, They're now seen as being part of the establishment. And Fox News' original audience, when they started, were the people who were dissatisfied with CNN and their major networks. Fox News came in as an outsider. Now they're rooted in the establishment, and that's going to undercut things. Fox News may have hoisted with its own petard, especially because now CNN in a very blatant ratings grab that I think is going to work, they're going to cover Donald Trump's rally live tonight at the exact same time as the debate on Fox News. Now, 97% of the people on my website poll said they're not going to bother watching the debate, but I'll bet you there's going to be a higher number for that CNN coverage of Trump. I'm going to tune into that going to tune into that right away. All right, we're going to grab ourselves a couple of phone calls. James in Tokyo, Ohio Gazimus, what's on your mind? Ohio Gazimus, Happy New Year to uh, you and Claire. Thank you. You're looking uh, very serious, a la Paul Krugman today. I'm looking at you on uh, <laughs> Bamboozer TV. you got to lighten up, Michael. Oh, okay, all right, I'll lighten up. Okay, two nuns walk into a bar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wanted to talk about um, the economy. Um, I don't think a lot of times I just hear you talking about putting a lot of assets in the gold and silver. And at this time, I don't think it's a good idea. I think 
gold and silver and other commodities are going to fall a lot further. I think oil can go down to 20 once uh, Cushing in the Midwest, uh, the tanks are full and hits 20 at that time. I think that there's a lot of money to be made in not oil by going back up because I believe a lot of oil companies are going to go out of business due to the low price because no one's going to make any money at 20. Chevron can't even make any money at like $48 uh, dollars a barrel. Mm -hmm. But everything's at that time, a lot of oil companies are going to collapse. And at that time, unlike uh, what Peter Schiff said about a year ago, get into the Aussie, uh, Canadian dollars, commodity based currencies. But at that time, well, these currencies have already collapsed, so they're going to collapse even further. Get into these currencies in a year from now. Okay, well, I think, I think you're, con you're confusing currency with investment metal. And uh, you need to understand that it's counterintuitive, but nations with a lot of exports want their currencies to be lower because it makes uh, the cost of their goods less expensive to the importing countries. And it's counterintuitive. Everybody would think, oh, I, we, we want our currency to be the strongest on the planet. But if you're an export-based economy, actually, no, you want uh, the other. You want your currency to be uh, down lower. And you have to draw a balance between how much you're importing and exporting and try and find that ideal valuation for your currency. I'm in agreement with you on the oil problem because along with the glut of oil is the fact that there's a reduction in demand because people don't have jobs to go to anymore. And that means they don't have money to go down to the shopping mall with or out to restaurants with. And the consumer side demand for oil products for uh, transportation uh, is definitely bottoming out. Now, we're going into a hard winter, so we're going to see a demand for natural gas and fuel oils go back up. But as far as uh, uh, gold, I mean, if you're looking at a leveraging of over 500 for gold, you know, at some point that's going to break loose. And that's well, what, you're, what you're talking about with, with – um yeah, the, the countries might want some of their price to be low, but I'm just talking to your audience who are Americans who have American dollars to invest because I believe and after a year from now, at that time, then you invest in these foreign currencies and they'll rise against the dollar. So I'm not talking about from the aspect of being, you know, a country. I'm talking from the aspect of your audience who are Americans, uh, like most of them probably, except for me and a few other people, but... um and a lot of other people, actually, but um, but I'm just talking about American dollar-based investors. And also, I'm very disappointed with you by the way that you're talking about uh, Bill Clinton. It's it's just disgusting and it's terrible. I mean, this is a one of our most outstanding presidents who travels to the poorest nations in Latin America to mentor young children. No, wait a minute. <laughs> Epstein's <laughs> Island on a private plane. All right. I, uh, okay, I agree with you. Okay. I'm sorry about that. All right. All right. Well, listen, anyway, listen. Care, th Mike. thank you very much for the phone call, and we're going to go to Sean in Washington. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey, what's up, Mike? Um, so I'm not really anti-Alex Jones. I have mixed feelings, but it's a good, you know, information source. But um, I, I've wondered for a long time his – his theme song, like couldn't Disney at this point tell him, you know, force him to stop using the Imperial March, the opening of his show. If they want it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming that he has licensed, uh, the rights to use that music and gotten permission from, uh, uh, the, uh, the rights holder. I mean, we have to do the same thing, uh, for my show. Of course, most of the music is written by my wife, Claire, who it's notoriously easy to get rights permissions from. Um, uh, <laughs> She's laughing in the other room now. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's a recognizable tune. It's part of his branding. As far as Alex Jones, uh, he and I, we have kind of a love-hate relationship. Uh, Alex got me my first start uh, in talk radio here on GCN back in 2007, for which I'm very grateful. Um, we disagree on some issues. We agree on a lot of the others. I do link to his videos and website, and I'm absolutely delighted that he has people up there in Oregon uh, to just, you know, keep the, pr the public visibility pressure up on these, you know, th the Wehrmacht as they move in on these people fighting for constitutional principles. Yeah, I hear you completely. Um, there's, a, I think it's Mark Connors' channel on YouTube. You can see uh, Victoria Sparks, I think, was the girl that was there. Yeah. And, 
Yeah, he, the the way they're covering that, I don't know. You know, he was saying that uh, Levon ran toward the authorities. Um, from what she says, it sounds more like he was maybe approaching them, but his hands were clearly up, and they just opened yeah, up. Yeah, and they him. just gunned him down in cold blood. All right, Sean, i got to let you go. we got to take a break for commercials. Thanks for the phone call, and we'll be right back. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to the show here. Now, Fox News very clearly trying to get Trump out of the race. Everybody's seeing them do that. But Fox News' own online poll has Trump at 66% right now. So, apparently Mike Huckabee is going to attend tonight's Trump event. And by the way, it's a rally in support of the veterans. It's it's not just a pure campaign rally. It's a big event to honor uh, the veterans. That's going to be a very positive message. And I'm wondering if Huckabee has dreams of being Trump's vice president, running mate, because I'm sure at this point the Republicans can see what's going on. Absent a world-changing event, it does look like Trump is going to be there. And again, we, we, we can't rule out massive, massive election fraud, and we're going to be talking about that in a little bit here. Now, Trump is out there saying a good relationship with Russia and China would be great for the United States of America. And this is an important thing for you to keep in mind, because right now Trump is the only candidate out there who's talking about pulling the U.S. back from the brink of war with Russia and China. All the other candidates are trying to drag you to the edge and kick you over into the abyss. So if you're opposed to wars, and that is the majority of the American people, that's where Trump is going. Now, a lot of people have written into me trying to get me to abandon Trump because he's he he's, refuses to condemn Israel for what Israel's doing. And, and Trump's very honest. You know, he's saying, I'm doing business with companies in Israel, and I have to be careful. And that's an honest thing. We We understand the realities of Israel having control of so much money. They get to call the shots for a lot of people's lives. But it is clear that Israel actually doesn't like Trump very much. They don't see him as obedient enough or loyal enough to Israel. He's too much of his own independent mind. And Israel absolutely hates that in an American president. And so it's not surprising that we had this story come out where Anne Frank's stepsister, Eva Schloss, is out there saying, Donald Trump is another Hitler. We're going to wag the Nazis, wag the Nazis, wag the Nazis. Trump is Hitler. Trump is Hitler. Which betrays a degree of desperation on the cusp of madness when they're out there wagging Hitler to try and tarnish Donald Trump. Another story coming out of InfoWars. Top Bilderberger. Martin Wolf is out there openly saying the global super elite must stop Donald Trump. They're not even trying to hide from you anymore that who you vote for doesn't matter to them. They will decide who the rulers of the nations will be. And basically, Wolf is out there saying that, you know, people are blaming the bankers for the hard economy. And they're rejecting the, the elites that dominate the economy and politics. How can they possibly do that? And he's saying the potential consequences of a Trump presidency are frightening. Yeah, all these fakers and phonies and scammers might actually lose their precious little grip on the lifeblood of the world's economy. Now, Bernie Sanders is very concerned about election fraud in the upcoming Iowa caucuses, and he has reason to be, because Microsoft got together with the Iowa Democratic and Republican parties to provide a technology platform so people can vote in the caucuses without having to actually show up in a polling place. They've got mobile apps. And everybody will push the button, and the machine will spit out, this is who won. Wide open to the potential of fraud. And Sanders is concerned because a lot of Microsoft employees, including their top executives, are fully on Hillary Clinton's side. And Sanders is saying they're going to set up their own check in addition to the exit poll, well, for those who actually show up. They're setting up their own system 
to verify the results. Because we know Hillary's going to try and steal Iowa. I mean, the political analysts are out there saying, if she loses Iowa and New Hampshire, her campaign is over. And we know she has resorted to election theft in the past. She did it back in 2008 in New Hampshire. They were going into New Hampshire with Barack Obama clearly in the lead in all the polls, clearly in the lead in all the exit polls, and the next morning, wow, sudden come from behind, victory for Hillary Rodham Clinton. And they, they explained the discrepancy between the official result and the exit polls by saying, well, the voters were lying to the exit pollers, which is nonsense. You don't know who those exit pollers are. You don't care what they think about you. And I'm not the only person being concerned. We have this other story that came out of truthout.org. Will the 2016 primaries be electronically rigged? Yes, they will. They absolutely will. We know it's an epidemic problem. And if you have not already seen that HBO documentary, Hacking Democracy, hunt it down and look at it. America's elections are a joke. You push a button, and a privately owned company with no civilian or government oversight tells you who your rulers are. They're going to they're gonna force who they want on you. And again, my philosophy is very simple. If a government cannot prove the accuracy, fairness, of the elections, by which they claim authority over us, then we the people are neither legally nor morally obligated to obey that government's dictates, to pay its bills, and certainly not to sacrifice life and limb of our children in that government's wars of conquest. American elections have become a global joke. They're so crooked they have to screw those ballots into the ballot boxes. And those electronic machines just made it faster and easier. That's why the government mandates them all across the country. They can steal elections and nobody can see see it. If you've never been over there, you need to visit a website called blackboxvoting.org. It's run by a wonderful lady named Bev Harris. In fact, she figures prominently in that HBO documentary, Hacking Democracy. And shows how easy it is for all these electronic machines to change the outcome of an election. With you, none the wiser. Now, Barack Obama, as they announced that fences have been mended with Israel, Obama has come on out warning against rising anti-Semitism and coming on out and saying, we are all Jews in the face of rising anti-Semitism. They're trying to take the Je suis Charlie a little bit further. We are all Jews when we're opposed to anti-Semitism. We're all in solidarity with Israel. No, we're not. You don't get to speak for me on that issue. And I want to say again, dismissing criticism of the actions of the government of Israel as anti-Semitism makes as much sense as dismissing criticisms of the actions of the Nazis as anti-Germanism. It's their behavior that is the problem, not their religion, not their ethnicity. And Obama, I think, just qualified for immediate removal from office under that 25th Amendment. For him to go on out there and say, we're all Jews in the face of rising anti-Semitism in a nation where the majority religion is some variation on Christianity. He's clearly out of touch there. All righty, Italy says 400,000 immigrants will cause their country to crumble. Sweden's going to expel 80,000 failed asylum seekers. The Belgian immigration minister suggested turning back boats of migrants, and he doesn't care if they drown. Tensions are getting really thick. Got to take a break for commercials. Back with the last segment of our program after these few words. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the last segment of our program on this Thursday. And we're going to talk about what's going on up in Oregon. As you know, the U.S. government has drawn first blood. Uh, there are conflicting stories about what happened. The witnesses are saying the cops just unloaded on these people. Killed one, wounded one, shot up the car. The police are saying, of course, that the victim came at them with a Bengal tiger or something like that. We know how often the police get caught lying in these situations. And again, I want to point out, we haven't seen any video from the dash cams on those police cars or the body cameras. 
We're just supposed to take their word. If you're a loyal American, you'll believe what we tell you to believe. I don't think so. Now, there is a wonderful video that we link to by a lady named Chris Ann Hall. She's a constitutional attorney, and she lays out point by point the issues behind what's going on up in Oregon. This is the part of the story the government and the corporate media don't want you paying attention to. Because the government is flat out in the wrong here. The Bureau of Land Management has been acting unconstitutionally and illegally. And basically we have the government on one side saying, give us your land or we'll shoot you. And on the other side you have the Bundys and the Hammonds citing the Constitution saying you can't do that. Now which one sounds like the criminal to you? And this video is worth looking at. We're trying to get this lady on the show here. But that's what's really going on here. That's what's driving all of this. The Bundys, the Red River down in Texas. The Bureau of Land Management is grabbing land under the guise of managing the wilderness. And then they'll wait a few months and turn around and say, oh, we didn't need the land after all. We'll sell it. And by the way, the Bureau of Land Management gets to keep a lot of that money. They have a financial incentive to steal land from you, the American people, and turn around and sell it to political cronies. It's wide open corruption. The federal government has clearly exceeded its constitutional limits. It has no right to any land other than what is underneath federal buildings, harbors, airports, military bases. That's it. It's in black and white. There's no gray area. No congressman can say, well, we're going to change that definition. No judge can say, well, we're going to fudge it a little bit. It's in the Constitution, and the only way to change the Constitution is with an amendment. Passed by the Congress, signed by the President, and ratified by three quarters of the states. Judge Anna Von Reitz is saying we're in the middle of of the American Amritsar. And it's a little more spread out and diffuse. It began with Ruby Ridge, continued with Waco, and now it's moving on to Oregon. A government that will act illegally, get caught at it, and solve its problems by just incinerating everybody, and then bulldozing the sites and burying the remains in an undisclosed location. The government is in the wrong here. And these people up in Oregon are taking a stand for their rights as American citizens under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. If you don't work to keep that Constitution and Bill of Rights, if you don't hold the government to those restrictions, then it's all been in vain. We're just another tin pot dictatorship, oligarchy. The government takes and you surrender. And look where we are already. We're at a point where we have been looted and plundered so much, the economy is breaking down. Because these money junkies don't understand, they cannot take money out of the top of the system until we can put it back in. And there are no jobs. There's no The manufacturing in this country has declined. Nobody wants to buy our products because they're overpriced pieces of junk. And nobody wants our agriculture because of GMO. All right, so let's spend the rest of the show talking about Flint, Michigan. Activists are pushing for an immediate state action to fix Flint's toxic water system because uh, the, the pipes have been damaged by this toxic water and the chemicals they were dumping in there to try and make it safe accelerated the corrosion of the pipes. They not only permanently damaged the brains of Flint's children, they permanently damaged those pipes. It's all going to have to be dug up and replaced. And it's not just Flint. Everybody is getting out the testing kits. All the parents are taking their kids to the doctor and say, check my kid for lead. And they're finding out already there are 14 communities in Michigan where the children are showing higher levels of lead than they are in Flint. Now there's a story coming out of second wave media about how in one town, 
Kalamazoo, the reporting methods were skewed to mask the fact that there were high levels of lead in the children. In those core city neighborhoods, they're covering it up. They don't want to fix the problem. They want to cover it up. And I guarantee you, this is not confined just to Michigan. We already know it's a problem in Ohio. New Orleans, Baltimore, Boston. Everybody is looking at their water and coming to the realization that government, to save a few bucks, thought it was okay for us to be drinking toxic water that permanently damages our children's brains. The damage is done. It can't be undone. Even if you could get all the lead out of the children, right now, with a magic wand, their brains will not recover. They're going to have learning difficulties in school. They're not going to be able to compete economically. Many of them will turn to crime, join gangs. This is a national disgrace. And the government's acting like the firefighters. Oh, there's a problem. We will rush in to fix it. We will make speeches. We will hand out bottled water. We'll have little buttons and a, and a telethon and everything will be well. No, that doesn't fix the problem. I find myself completely in agreement with Michael Moore. Sending in a couple of trucks full of bottled water is not a solution. It's something to look good for the media. Remember, the, the, the governor of Michigan, his first act was to hire public relations firms. They're not interested in the public health. They just want their image to look good. That's not wise management of the country or the state or the neighborhood. It's just politics as usual. I'm hoping that all of you are getting water testing kits. And you're going to test your water, and if you come up with a result that is bad, you email me. This is a call to Rivero's Rangers. I want to build a map of the United States with little dots where the tests are taken that will open up and say, there's this much lead, there's this, this much bacterial contamination, there's this much cadmium. We already know from the UK Guardian, they have documents that major U.S. cities east of the Mississippi have been deliberately underreporting heavy metal contamination of the drinking water. I can't think of any more fundamental responsibility for the government than to provide us with safe, clean drinking water, and they have failed, failed, failed. And amazingly enough, the Flint city government is still demanding the citizens of Flint pay for this toxic water. And the citizens are saying, no, you, you're guilty of false advertising. You told us the water was safe. It wasn't. You knew it wasn't. You covered it up. Why should we pay for you to harm our children? This is not going away, nor should it. All right, there's the music. Time for me to get out of here and get something useful done with the rest of the day. We'll be back tomorrow, Friday, with the lovely Lady Claire here on the Genesis Communication Network. Until then, aloha, America.